Lord, we long for the day when, when you make all things new. And so, Holy Spirit, please help us to live now in that certainty. Worshipping Jesus now by faith and then by sight. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us in your word tonight. And, Lord, you know the need of each individual that is in this auditorium, even if that's known only to you and to that person. So I pray that you would minister by your word through your spirit to each and every need that we have all come with this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please do take, uh, take your seats. And if you were here last week, you'll know that I mentioned three books that have been uh, that are helpful to accompany this series, and we've now got them uh, for sale. The first one is called Strange New World. That's by Carl Truman. And that's, uh, believe it or not, this is, a, this is a, a, a simpler version of a more complicated book. And this was tough enough for me, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> uh, this, this is a much more, this is an accessible version of the, the history of, the, of Western society and Western culture over the last few uh, centuries, really, tracking through how we got to the point we're at now and the dominance of expressive individualism. A strange New World, how thinkers and activists redefined identity and sparked the sexual revolution. That kind of tracks through how we got here as, a, as, as the society in the West. And then how to live as, and begins to think about how we can be equipped as Christians to live faithfully in the context that we're in. Uh, and then a couple of books, uh, one written by an Australian pastor called Stephen McAlpine. I'll be quoting that this evening. That's called Being the, well, it does say Being the Good Guys, but then it's been printed over and said Being the Bad Guys, How to Live for Jesus in a World that Says You Shouldn't. Really helpful starter in getting us thinking about how in this post-Christian society we can live faithfully for Jesus. Uh, and then also... Uh, um, again, a more detailed work. That's why it's, I think this is the most expensive one. I think, is, is it £13, this one, I think? But it is, it is worth it. I've, well, you can see where I've got to. I've, my bookmark is there, so I've nearly finished it. So far, it's been, it's been really, really useful. Lots of underlining. Exiles on mission. Remember, we saw last week, that's who we are. We're exiles. And we'll see in the rest of 1 Peter how we're exiles on mission. How Christians can thrive in a post-Christian world. And they're available uh, at the back later. Well, as Sarah mentioned earlier, 10 years ago, we were settling into this new building. And we were, we were enjoying some wonderful first few services here. Do you want to just raise your hand if you're a part of the church at that point? There'll probably be, be some of us. Okay, a sprinkling of us were part of that, the church 10 years ago. Well, we welcomed people from all over the globe. We, we celebrated God's goodness towards us. We sang his praises, we heard from his word, we enjoyed fellowship together. And one Sunday in in October 2012, I remember we, after the morning service, we just had one morning service then, we walked out of the doors to head home for our lunch and we were bathed in glorious sunshine, a bit like like this morning actually. And it was a a delightful scene for us. On that same day, 10 years ago, our brothers and sisters in the Anglican Church of All Saints Peshawar in Pakistan had come together for their service of worship and sharing the Lord's Supper. However, on that same day as they were leaving their service, they walked into a very different scene. Two suicide bombers detonated explosives, killing at least 80 people and injuring many more. And as the Archbishop of Canterbury noted at the time, the victims of this appalling attack had been targeted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And similar scenes have been repeated elsewhere as Christians face violent persecution. We're going to put on the screen a map from the Open Doors uh, organization. It's called the World Watch List. Orange indicates very high, red extreme, 
risk of the kind of persecution that is happening. And that's updated every, uh, every January. And we're going to come back to this when we get to uh, part of chapter four. We've actually got a speaker from Open Doors going to come and, and, and preach to us on, from part of that chapter and share what's happening around the world as Christians are persecuted. Well, the Christians in that church in Pakistan experienced a dramatic change on that day. In one moment, they were celebrating the glorious truths of Christ and the resurrection, and the next, they were helping the wounded and the injured and grieving for those that they'd lost. And in our book of 1 Peter, the writer also dramatically moves from ecstasy to agony in the space of a few short verses. The bright certainties of the future, which we looked at last week, move into the gloomy but very real realities of the present in verse 6 onwards. So please uh, turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1, page 1217, if you have a church Bible. And we're going to see gold in grief in these few verses. So let me read verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. The Apostle Peter writes into the reality of what his first century readers, recipients of the letter, were writing. He knows that they may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, he doesn't mention specifically what those trials are. That They'd have not known all too well what the trials were. So he doesn't go into the details. But from the broader scope of the letter, we can surmise that the kind of trials they were facing were, were not some kind of state persecution, nor was it a one-off period of identifiable, uh, often violent persecution. That that would come later, but this is not it. Rather, these Christians were being ostracized socially. They were being treated unjustly. They were being disadvantaged. They were being excluded. They were being shunned. They were marginalized in society, alienated in relationships, threatened with a loss of honor, and socioeconomic standing. And unsurprisingly, these trials were beginning to take their toll. They were becoming disheartened. They were beginning to question whether their faith was it somehow deficient in some way. And as such, Peter writes to help them rejoice in the midst of their current experience and to reassure and to encourage these weary saints. So that was the position of the, the original first century recipients of Peter's letter. And we believe that God's word speaks powerfully into our life, our lives as well, don't we? You know, until recent years, I think the church in the West at least has struggled to apply 1 Peter into its situation. So if you you read commentaries on on 1 Peter that were written 10, 20 years ago, they kind of struggle to apply it to the West in, uh, in those times. One danger we must avoid is to try to find applications for us by making cheap analogies and pretending such things are suffering for faithfulness to the Lord. So getting, getting low marks in an exam or a job interview going badly or getting injured playing sport are, are not suffering for the Lord. Claiming that they are trivializes the sufferings of the churches in the first century and the church in other parts of the world today. And neither must we go to the other end of the extreme and deliberately try and seek out some persecution. It's helpful to know that the Bible never says that every believer in every generation, in every place, will always suffer. The Apostle Paul does write in 2 Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But we're not to take that to automatically mean that anyone who's not currently being persecuted is therefore not wanting to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. So we've got to have that, that, that balanced understanding. But with those qualifying statements granted, listen to these challenging words to Western Christians by Charles Ringman. There are a number of emphases in the contemporary church that continue to distort its life. One has to do with the erroneous idea that the Christian life is basically a fair-weather experience. 
I wonder, is it too much to say that the church in the postmodern West has sometimes struggled to apply 1 Peter meaningfully because the church today isn't as distinct as the church in the first century? Did we become comfortable and quiet at home rather than living as elect, rather than living as elect exiles? Have we, did we not suffer many trials because we were not all that distinct? Did our light in the darkness become a dim, murky glow? Well, if the Christian life is pitched, is sold, is advertised as basically, is preached as a basically a fair weather experience, then, well, we will ha- have had a shock in recent years in the West. Because the needle of the weather barometer has moved. I first preached on these verses, I think it was about eight years ago. The barometer has moved since then. The needle is at stormy for the Christians on the world watch list that we saw earlier. The needle was at rain for Peter's readers in the first century and for us. I think the needle has moved from fair to change at the very least. Stephen McAlpine writes, The Bible tells us to expect hostility as Christians. I say this now before we get to the specific narratives of the rival gospel we are facing. Because the cultural shifts and challenging responses that many in the Western church face today can be discombobulating. What a great word. Let's just note that. I mean, it's worth it. Buy the book for that word alone. I've got to say it again now. (laughs) Discombobulating if we do not have this reality locked away. If the church is bred on a diet of self-help books that try to convince us that God's intention is to make our lives as smooth as possible, we will be suckers in a hostile world. No wonder we become confused, angry, or despairing when the culture is throwing rotten tomatoes not rose petals, at us. So Peter writes to help these Christians understand why they are facing what they're facing, why some of these trials are are happening. And he wants to assure them that that what's happening isn't outside of God's sovereignty. And we too, as 21st century believers here in this society here, at this time in which God has placed us, it's not an accident. We've got to recognize that there are various human and spiritual forces that are railed against God and against his people. And yet we must also recognize that amidst those trials, God in his mercy and his wisdom is working out his perfect plan. And he's chosen to involve us, even people like us, in that. McAlpine again. As we read 1 Peter, it's clear that what the Christians were experiencing back then was not the full-scale persecution and being fed to the lions that we commonly think of when we think of the persecution of the early church. Now that came but later. Rather, They were maligned for not joining the wild partying and insulted because of the name of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 12 tells us that they were accused of doing wrong. And chapter 3, verse 16, that people spoke maliciously about them. This was good old garden variety, abuse and scorn for being followers of Jesus. In those days, they didn't have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a host of websites through which to deliver the abuse and scorn. But there is little difference in content between what they were experiencing and what we are experiencing in the West today. Signing up to Team Jesus in AD 50 resulted in the same cultural rejection as it does now. Is signing up to Team Jesus in AD 2022, still worth it? Well, absolutely, says Peter. 
And he's going to give us this evening four reasons for joy amidst the kind of trials that Peter describes, whether that's in the first century or the 21st century West. Four reasons for joy. And the first one is, verse 6, that trials are limited in time. So verse 6 again. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Though the pain and grief of persecution and and suffering are very real, they are also limited in time. And there are people in this church who will tell you their own stories of very real grief and trials, but how they have been limited in time, whether that's days or weeks or months or years or decades. And there have been occasions when people have really laid into what this church and many others believe, particularly on social media. And I can tell you that those are difficult periods. Especially when we're misunderstood and maligned. And, those are di- and we've had those. Those are difficult periods and we will have them. But they do pass. And as we sung earlier, in the midst of whether it's that or something else, we have to remember that who can stand against us, as we sung, when our God is for us. Now, all kinds of trials may or may not be brief in time when, when simply considered against the whole a span of a earthly life. But they're certainly brief when compared with the future eternal glory. It's a perspective held by the Apostle Paul. He writes famously in Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And not only are our sufferings temporary, but they also have a purpose, and this is the second reason for joy. Verse 7. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So when these Christians in the first century Asia Minor were faced with the trials that they were facing, they were understandably beginning to question whether there was something deficient in their faith. Was this really supposed to be what life was like following Jesus? It was pretty costly. They'd be asking, had God abandoned us? Are we really his precious children? Well, we find in verse 7 that in God's sight, their faith is genuine faith, greatly valued and of ultimate significance. For genuine faith is faith that has been refined. The trials that they're facing aren't a sign of deficiency, but of, of genuineness. And then you'll see that Peter uses the imagery of of gold being refined in a fire and actually says that faith is even better, even stronger than than that. Gold was the most precious material then known and gold was refined in a fire in order to burn away any impurities to leave pure, refined, precious metal. And so that kind of imagery is used to help us think of our faith being smelted, refined in the fire of the various kinds of trials in this life. And coming out even more precious than gold. And so as we travel through this process, we're left with something more precious than gold. Something that will not eventually perish, but will last into eternity. So that's one word picture uh, that's in this passage, that of being refined like gold, or even better than gold. Let me share a couple of other different word pictures that the scriptures use Uh, elsewhere, but to make the same point. Now, our former senior pastor, Peter Lewis, captures the sense of this well uh, when he said this, we're running a race, but it is not a sprint, but a marathon, and it calls for endurance, perseverance. It's the glory of going on in spite of hindrances, opposition, and weariness. By it, we are made strong to go the distance. What would you be if life had no trials for you? No disappointments, setbacks, or pressures? Pressures. 
the sheltered life does not tend to strengthen character. What would you be if life had no trials for you, no disappointments, setbacks, or pressures? The sheltered life does not tend to strengthen character. There was once an experiment held in the Arizona desert. And they built these huge structures, dome structures, glass and steel on a two-acre site. They were dome structures containing five climatic zones with a miniature rainforest, a savanna, a desert, an ocean, and marsh. They were all airtight, all self-supporting, and they were, the purpose of them being built were, were part of some research to see if human beings could survive in outer space. However, the ecosystem failed in, in various different ways. For instance, oxygen levels fell, ants and cockroaches multiplied hugely. But perhaps what was most fascinating of all was what happened to the trees. You see, some of the trees shot up very quickly, up to 20 feet a year in the protected conditions. However, before too long, those trees, those trees that had shot up so quickly, toppled over. Because in the protected conditions, in the absence of any wind or storms. They had not put down their roots deep. They had not grown strong against resistance. And it's through the experience of and the exposure to storms that, that trees put down deeper roots and so become stronger. And so it is for the Christian. Deeper roots, stronger branches. And I've used that phrase sometimes to refer, refer to the, the importance of deeper doctrinal understanding. And here in, in our verses and elsewhere, God demonstrates to us how he also uses the trials of life to, to strengthen our roots so that our branches are stronger. So you may be here this evening and your pathway may be just laid, laid with fiery trials at the moment. Whether that's at, the, at one of the universities or in the workplace or at home. Well, know that in the midst of those fiery trials, the Lord is refining you. He is bringing about his purposes. And he knows it's not easy. And God promises his grace to be in sufficient supply for the day ahead. And you will emerge with your faith refined by fire with a faith more precious than gold. You won't have a sheltered life, but you will have a strengthened character. Deeper roots. Stronger branches. Stronger branches that will stand in the storms of life. Stronger branches that will produce an abundant fruit. And stronger branches that will provide shelter for others. Thirdly, the third reason for rejoicing, that trials bring final vindication. A number of years ago, this is, uh, I don't know how many years ago now, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, a little bit more than that. 12, 13 years ago, a student magazine in, in Nottingham uh, ran an article about one of the Christian unions, and it was uncomplimentary about the CU, to, put, to say the least. I also would say in, in some of the years since they've published articles which are, have been more generous. However, this particular article tore into the Christian union and the students within it. They carried a portrayal of uh, interviews with members of the CU committee that painted them in a very unfavorable light. 
the front page of the magazine was emblazoned with the words, see you in hell. See you in hell. And that was a testing time for those young believers and those young leaders, some of whom were students at Cornerstone at the time. That's tough to face when you're, you know, 19. It's tough to face however you old are, but when you're 19 or 20, man. Well, in the year of that magazine article, the CU and its leaders didn't receive any praise or glory or honor from, from society. Neither did the churches that Peter was writing to. They were faithful to Jesus in, and actually were shunned by society. But that same faith, that won't always happen, but sometimes it does. And that same faithfulness to Jesus will result in praise, honor, and glory when all is said and done. So verse 7. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now that's not some prize that's given, like an award. It's rather it's a sense of final vindication for the believer. That you're on the right side of history. God's eternal history. And a share not in our own glory, but in Christ's glory. And so the fourth reason for joy, we shall share in Christ's glory, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, of course, the guy writing this, the Apostle Peter, had spent seen seen Jesus, spent loads of time with him. But these believers that he was writing to, scattered across the, the distant corners of the Roman Empire, they had never seen Jesus, and yet they loved him. And they didn't see him now, and yet they believed in him. Because blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And we don't see Jesus either, do we? We live by faith, not by sight. And blessed are we if we have not seen and yet have believed. And we'll share in Christ's glory. So we've seen those four reasons for joy amidst the trials. That they're limited in time. That they refine our faith. That we're brought final vindication and a share in Christ's glory. And all of these can give us, as the hymn says, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. And let me also say that we've got to be aware that God's purposes in the grief and in the trials that we experience, maybe the the grief and the trials and the, uh, the experiences that you're having now, we may not, that God's purposes in those may not be fully known in a week or in a year or in a decade, or in a lifetime. We live by faith, not by sight. We don't see Jesus, but one day we will. We're just going to touch on verses 10 to 12 briefly. Those verses will will be on the screen, and... As you look at these verses, let me ask you this evening. What kind of Christ do you want? What kind of Jesus do you want to follow? Do you want a Christ who is there to make your life comfortable? A Christ who tells you only what you want to hear? A Christ who massages your ego? A Christ who fulfills your agenda? A Christ who won't bring any inconvenience or rejection into your life. Brothers and sisters, if you think you are following that kind of Christ, then the trials that you will face will come as a great surprise and actually you'll find that you'll have little to be joyful about in the midst of them. Because to follow Christ is to follow the same path that he took, the path of suffering and then glory. Following Jesus means following Jesus, suffering and then glory. Our life will mirror Christ's life. And maybe you're here tonight and you need to know that the path you walk today doesn't end at the trials that you face today. Because the Christ that we follow is not only a crucified Christ, 
We follow a Christ who is risen and ascended and glorified. We follow a Christ who will return in all his glory. We follow a Christ who will vindicate his people. And we follow a Christ who leads his people through trials for his purposes. And a Christ who comforts and strengthens us even as he refines us, even as he's enabling us to push down those roots deeper. And what these Old Testament prophets saw from afar, what the angels marveled at, we can experience. So let's lift our eyes this evening. Have our hearts stirred as we walk whatever path we're on at the moment, whatever it's laden with. And we can know a deep assurance that we have been called, chosen, delighted in, as citizens of hope. Let's bow our heads. And in the silence, why don't you bring before the Lord whatever trials that you are facing, whether they're known to a few or a many or many, or just between you and the Lord. Maybe it's some form of rejection. or some form of exclusion. And maybe you're simply struggling with how hard it is to be refined in the fire, how difficult it is to keep going in the marathon. how hard it can be to stand in the storms. Would, you know, would we know that your grace is sufficient? Lord, we praise you that you, you are sovereign. All of history is in your hands. Our lives are not spinning out of control, but are held in your good and glorious reign. Lord, help us to trust that you are working your purposes out in us and through us. And Lord, we thank you that one day you will return And you will make all things new. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen.